In his commentary on the book of Ezekiel, Brandon L. Fredenberg wrote, other than the opening vision of the wheel in the middle of the wheel, the first half of chapter 37 is probably the best known portion of this strange book to audiences otherwise unfamiliar with the Bible. The text is celebrated in the slave spiritual that goes, dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones. Stuart Briscoe commented, Thanks to the spiritual, many people are familiar with dim bones, even if the magnificent song has done little for their understanding of either theology or anatomy. Well, we are familiar with the valley of the dry bones, but what does it mean? Ezekiel chapter 37 contains a story of dry bones and the sign of two sticks. First, we notice the valley of dry bones. Chapter 1, ver chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. Now, we remember that Ezekiel is prophesying in a time when Judah has been taken into captivity in Babylon. They are far away from home. They know that the city's been destroyed, that the temple's been destroyed. They are now a people without hope. Here is what we read in chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. I've spent very little time around human bones of any kind of animal, much less of humans. But just picture this scene of a valley full of dry human bones. Now, I have been with people when they died, and of course I've been to funerals where I've seen the bodies of those who are deceased. But this is after the process of decay. It's been a long time before you get to the dry bones. And here is Ezekiel taken to this valley of very dry bones. This is indeed a spooky situation. Now some call it a vision, and in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has a number of visions. This one doesn't say it's a vision, it's like a vision. One commentator called it an enacted parable. But here he is, he is surrounded by all these bones. That would be a little bit uncomfortable, I think, to a Jewish priest. After all, you were supposed to limit your exposure to the dead. We do know that it was the common practice at some point in Jewish history that after the body had gone from uh, being a body to just being bones, that they would remove the bones and put them in ossuaries, that is, small boxes that would save space, I guess. But here he is. These bones are very dry. From a human viewpoint, it would be impossible for these bones to come to life. In the Old Testament, we have a few people who were raised from the dead, but they hadn't been dead very long. Even in the New Testament, when people are raised from the dead, they hadn't been dead very long. Uh, the comment about Lazarus being raised from the dead. You know, he's been in there four days, he's going to stink. But still, he had his body. But these are just bones. The Lord asked a question to Ezekiel. He says, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, how would you like to be asked that question? And the prophet makes his reply, O oh Lord God, you know. It was a difficult question. You wouldn't think that the bones could live again. But let's remember, God is asking the question. Remember who's asking the question. 
And so Ezekiel gives a wise answer. Perhaps he's being a bit evasive. He admitted his ignorance and God's knowledge. We would be better off if we would just admit we don't have the answers to every question. One teacher said, I don't know, I don't have to know, and I'm thankful I don't have to know. In situations where we don't know the answer, we need to remember that God does know the answer. Here, will these bones live again? Can these bones live again? Ezekiel says, you know. Then the prophet is given a very strange commission, verses 4 through 6. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Prophesy to these bones. Now, preachers have told of preaching to cows and horses for practice. Those raised on a farm, they go out and they just practice their sermons with the cows and the horses as, as their audience. But preaching to dry bones, dead bones and bodies, that would indeed make a strange audience. This was a really dead church, we might say. But the instruction is preach the word of the Lord to them. Tell them what they need to hear. Verse 5, God made a promise to the bones, you shall live. The picture is, is that the sinews are going to come back, the flesh is going to come back, the skin is going to come back, and then breath will be put in it and they'll live again. What comes to mind is Raiders of the Lost Ark, when, if I spoil this for you, you've had many years to watch the movie, but, but at that one scene where the uh, characters look into the Ark of the Covenant and they just begin to uh, disintegrate. disintegrate. That's the word I was waiting for. Yeah. Well, just, just picture that in reverse. You have the skeleton and all of a sudden it has the sinews, the muscles, and then it has the skin. It just comes back together. Uh, that would be about as strange a sight as seeing what we saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Notice that the prophet is an instrument of God in bringing life. How? He is speaking the word of the Lord. He is speaking a message of hope and optimism. He speaks of life ahead by the Spirit of God. Verse 6. Preachers still need to speak the word of the Lord. That should be our message. That should be our only message. Well, verses 7 through 10 tells us something about the message that Ezekiel delivers. And then the spirit of life or the breath of life that comes. He says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, and it's an exceedingly great army. He needs to speak to them. They need the breath of the spirit of life within them. And when he does so, they come back together, their bodies again. He breathes the light, he speaks, and the breath comes back into them, and they're alive again. And they are an exceedingly great army. Well, just what does this mean? What is the meaning of this vision or parable? Well, the bones are the Jewish nation in exile. 
Those from Judah have been taken into captivity. They've lost hope of being a nation again. They are the Jewish nation in exile. This is a dead nation, so to speak. They're scattered over Babylon. And they actually feel that they are cut off from God. So it's a very common thing for people in a certain land to think of their God being the God of that land. And if they left that land, they left God behind. After all, they were taken away from the temple of God and they knew the temple had been destroyed. But they feel cut off from God and they have no hope for their future. The nation is in captivity. But you know, while the nation was in captivity, God was a captive. <clears throat> the people experience hopelessness, but they need to realize that their hope is in God. Verses 12 and then verse 14 makes the statement that God is going to bring them back to their land. There will be a national deliverance from their oppressor. Verse 6 and 13 indicate that they will know that God is the Lord. I guess the application for us today is, you know, we get in bad situations. There's crime, there's moral decay, there are indeed dead churches. And sometimes one might ask in a metaphorical way, can these bones live? Well, if we proclaim the truth, the word of God, we can enable the spirit of God to bring life. Well, there is a second part to our lesson. The sign of the two sticks, verses 15 through 28. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take a stick and write on it, for Judah and the people of Israel associated with them. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with him. And join them one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. Ezekiel is to do a visual illustration. He's to take two sticks. The sticks are going to be large enough he can write something on them. And on the one stick, he will write about Judah. The southern kingdom, after Israel was divided, the southern kingdom consisted mainly of Judah. And so he's to write Judah and the people of Israel associated with him, Judah being one of the sons of Jacob. On the other stick, write Ephraim and those of Israel associated with him. Ephraim was one of the two sons of Joseph. And he was, I guess, the more prevalent of the sons. And uh, so Ephraim is speaking basically of Joseph's line. They had led the way into Israel when the kingdom divided, the northern kingdom. Ezekiel is to take these two sticks, write on them the identity of each, and then join the two sticks together. Well, what does this sign really mean? Well, that's a pretty good question. The people want to know. Verse 21, then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. And they shall be no longer two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. What does this mean? Well, it's speaking of the coming unity of the two kingdoms. Now, the Mormons take this passage, and they can misuse many passages, and they say that the two sticks represent two revelations from God. The one stick is the Bible, and the other stick is the Book of Mormon. You really have to do some fanciful thinking to make it mean that. That's, not what, that's certainly not what uh, the message is here. 
But it is saying something about the future glory of the United Kingdom. It pictures Israel and Judah coming back together. That someone in the line of David will be their king and their shepherd. Verse 24. It says that Canaan will be their eternal home. Now we need to remember that when it talks about forever. That could mean a long time rather than an endless time. A covenant will be made with them. And they will have continual fellowship with God. What does this mean? Well, we could take it literally, and some do. They would say that someone in the line of David will actually become king over a united Israel. will reign over them. But that raises some questions. Others say, well, it's messianic in nature. The one in the line of David will be Jesus, the Messiah. The kingdom that's established will be his church. There are those who say, well, this prophecy is conditional. And it was not fulfilled because the people did not repent. The northern Israelites really never returned to the land. Judah was brought back. There was no literal king from the line of David. John Willis observes, This is another prophetic prediction which has never been fulfilled and never will be because the people did not respond in repentance and conversion. Now, the book of Ezekiel with all of its imagery is a book that has been made to mean all kinds of things. Those who predict a future or future literal kingdom where Jesus will return and reign for a thousand years. They like these kind of texts. You can kind of make them mean what you want. But we need to see the clear message of Ezekiel here. What we do see is the power of God. God gives this an act of parable. Ezekiel preaches to the bones, and they come back to life. An image, a message rather, that God has the power to restore a nation that thought they had no hope. Judah would return to their land, to Jerusalem. They would rebuild Jerusalem. They would rebuild the temple. They would exist for a number of years. They would have their problems. When Jesus came, the leaders of the people, for the most part, rejected him as the Messiah. And the nation would eventually go away. The temple would again be, be destroyed. For a time, though, people will be returned, there will be a sense of reuniting. I think the best message to take from this text is that God's word is powerful. Sometimes I think we give up hope. We do not realize or recognize or we forget the power of God. There are a lot of problems in the world. God is greater. Put our trust in God 